Hi guys, my name is Steven and I just wanted to make a video explaining how to use the Move It Setup Assistant with any robot. So let's go ahead and launch the Setup Assistant. So it's called Ross Launch Move It Setup Assistant Setup Assistant dot launch. So that's the terminal command. And when I launch that, it brings up this GUI. So if you're starting from scratch, you're going to want to create a new Move It configuration package. So what's going to happen is we're going to create a, or we're going to import a URDF format that we created or somebody else created, and it's going to tell Move It the specific description of your robot. So at this point, Move It has no idea anything about your robot. So this is how Move It can be configured for a specific robot. You need to make sure that you are using the URDF extension, so it can't have the Zacro extension. Um, and there is a ROS node that you can use to convert between the Zacro file format and the URDF format. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and navigate on my computer where I have my URDF file for this robot. So I'm going to go ahead and open that. And when I load this, it's going to parse that URDF file. So I'm going to go ahead and load these files. And at this point, if your URDF was created correctly, you should see a robot here on the right. Now that we've loaded that, we can go ahead and go to the Self Collisions tab. So this is where MoveIt is going to drive the robot to random joint configurations. And they refer to that as the uh, sample density. I like to turn this all the way up. And what that means is it's going to drive this robot to 1 million different robot configurations, which just means different random joint angles. And it's going to look and see if any one of these STL bodies is in collision with a different STL body. And if they are, that means there's a collision. And if they never collided, then that probably means it'll never collide. So you can go ahead and click Generate Collision Matrix. So for the base link and the shoulder link, we can see that it decided those are always adjacent links. Um, and then let's, for example, wrist one and wrist three clearly could never collide no matter what configuration a robot was in. So now that we've done that, we've optimized our collision detection because now when collision detection runs in real time, it knows what it needs to check and what it doesn't need to check from this initial test. So the next thing we can look at is our virtual joints. So virtual joints allow you to connect the joints described in your URDF to the real world. So to do this, I'm going to go ahead and select add virtual joint. And the first thing I need to do is give it a name. And this could be anything you want. And I just might call it fixed frame. And now what I want to do is I want to define the first link described in my URDF file. So the URDF file starts at the base of your robot and builds its way up. So the first joint described in my URDF file is the one closest to the ground, and it's the one that would be fixed to the ground in my case. So it's called base link. It's the joint here at the bottom. And then parent link is the link that the base link would be connected to in the real world. For my robot, it'll be connected to the world. And that's because it's an industrial robot that doesn't have any motion on the bottom. It's not connected to a mobile base. Uh, and since it's fixed to the real world, I can choose the joint type called fixed. Now there's two other types of joint types. Uh, the most, probably the second most common one is the planar. And what that means is that the base of your robot can have three degrees of freedom with respect to your world. It can move in the X direction, the Y direction, and also in the rotational theta directions. And typically, in this case, if you've selected planar, that means you're using a mobile robot, and that probably means you want to have your uh, virtual frame between the base of your robot to the odometry frame of your mobile robot. And then the last option is the floating frame. So this means that the joint between your manipulator 
and your mobile robot frame has six degrees of freedom. Uh, and I think this is probably only the case for something like a drone. But as it is, I have a fixed link with the parent frame to be uh, world. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that. Planning groups are probably the most important step of the setup assistant steps. It doesn't matter, but you can refer to this name later on as you set up your move group. The next thing we need to choose is our kinematic solver. So you definitely need a kinematic solver for any group of joints that you intend on planning motion for. It's a good idea to use the default one that comes with Move It, and it's called KDL. And KDL is a kinematic solver that is not considered closed form. So instead it has to numerically solve for the solution every time it goes and solves a uh, solves the kinematic equations. You have to give a few search parameters here to let it know what you want it to do. So in this case, we have a search resolution, which will tell it the step size of the search. And then also we need to tell it how long is it, it can acceptably look for a solution. So at some point, if it looks for a solution for too long, it's going to mess up our motion and we need to tell it to time out. And then this bottom option is how many times that numerical solver will look for a solution. And uh, just using three as a default works fine. All these default values should work fine. Um, later on, as you get your robot set up and you've confirmed that all the different components work, um, you probably want to go back and create a specific kinematic solver for your robot arm. And you can use uh, a particular software program called the IK Fast, um, and it works uh, as a Move It plugin. It'll create a plugin that can show up in this list, and instead of having a numerical kinematic solution, it'll have a closed form kinematic solution. So the next thing we want to look at is this uh, the group default planner. So OMPL is the Open Motion Planning Library. And it's not just a single motion planner, it's a whole set of motion planners. Uh, so to get familiar with these, uh, we can first see here that the names are not very descriptive. So you probably need to look up a certain one of these if you wanna use a certain one of these. So I'll go ahead and show you a particular reference on how to identify what the differences are here. Uh, but essentially the idea is that each one of these uses some sort of a optimizing strategy to solve for a particular uh, motion between any given two points in your workspace. Uh, and depending on what your constraints are for your job, you may wanna optimize to different constraints and you might wanna use different types of optimizers. So there's a link um, on OMPL documentation that goes through and describes or at least gives you a brief summary of each one of these abbreviations that we saw on our Move It Setup Assistant. Uh, if you don't really want to take too much time to figure out what you need to do here, you can just pick the RRT. So basically it just uses a uh, tree sampling algorithm to connect the beginning and end goal. All right, so now that we've set up our kinematics and we've set up our default motion planner, now we need to tell Move It about a particular set of joints of the robot. Uh, and I, I think probably the way to make sense of this is when we have a single arm here, intuitively we know just all the joints here in our URDF file need to be used in the planning of our robot position. But say if you had two robot arms here, you may need them to be planned separately or you probably would need them to be planned separately. And then another situation is if if you have a robot arm and it has a gripper on it and the gripper has uh, different types of commands like position command and velocity command and force command, you may and probably would want to command that gripper completely separately from the arm. So I'm going to go ahead and add joints to my group. And these names come straight from the URDF. And since I just have a simple industrial robot arm here, 
all six joints need planned for because I'm only going to have one group and so everything I intend to use needs to be in this group. Now if you see world in this list you can add world to this group and what that means is the world link shows up in your URDF file and so there's already a transformation described between the world frame and the first frame of your robot. In this case there's not a world frame. So there's no frame describing the relationship between the world and the base of the robot. Alright, so now I've defined a group and that group is called manipulator and it's made of six joints and they're all Revolute joints. So that means I have finished this step um, but if I had a gripper I could add another group and I could call it gripper and most likely there would not be a kinematic solver because your gripper most likely just has certain states that you can command it to be in uh, but there is a chance that maybe you have a complicated gripper that has uh, position control or something and maybe it has a planner and that's where you would add that here but usually you would just leave that as none uh, and then also you probably don't need a planning group for that uh, you would add your joints uh, so here one of these names would be the name of your gripper and you would just go ahead and drag that over here with this arrow and that would create your second group so you would have a group named manipulator and then another group called gripper so now that we've done this let's go over to the robot poses this is where we can define some default poses for the robot and these default poses can be used later on to uh, call directly from our code um, just using the string name that we define as the pose name. So in this case I'm going to go ahead and define one of the poses as stand because that's what the robot is currently doing. And then I'll add one more and I'll call it home. And as you move these sliders you should of course see the ro robot move as you expect and you should also see that the robot stops at the joint limits described within your URDF file. So I just saved two positions. And if you click the move it button, it will toggle between the poses that you've defined. So now let's move on to the end effectors tab. The end effector tab is where you would input any group that you defined above in the planning group that describes your end effector. So I'm going to go ahead and click add end effector. And earlier we almost created a group called gripper. We didn't actually do it. Um, and actually this could be whatever you want to call it. You could call that. It's just the name that we can refer to later. So that could be hand. Uh, the group would have to be gripper and that's what we would have created earlier in the planning groups and then the parent link is where that gripper is connected to your robot so in my case it would be the last link of my robot and that happens to be called risk 3 link and uh, the parent group is optional and you don't need it so if I wanted this end effector I would go ahead and click save but in my situation I don't want it. So what I'm going to be having is a welding torch and so I can just have a fixed transformation between the end of my robot to the tool tip of my welding torch and it will just be a single transformation that I define within my code. Alright so now for the passive joints. So passive joints are joints that are not actuated and so a few examples of these are something like a caster on a mobile robot. So maybe your mobile robot has two drive wheels and it has a caster. And the caster cannot be commanded directly, you can't control the caster, but the dynamics and kinematics of that robot depend on that caster. And so it's important for MoveIt to know which one of those joints is this passive joint so it can account for it, but not actuate it. So in this case, since I have a standard robot arm, there aren't any passive joints, so I can just skip over this step. 
Now I need to enter my author information. This is just my name and my email address. And it doesn't need to be real, but of course it's helpful if it is because that's not a real email address. All right, so these are the files that will be automatically generated and put within a package. And I would like this package to appear within my workspace. Um, before I do that, I would like you or suggest you to click on each one of these and read the description that appears on the right. Uh, these are just all the configuration files and as you get into using this with a real robot, you will end up using most of these. So it's too important to realize what they are. Uh, but what I need to do now is I need to select a location to store this. So I know I want to put it within my Move It workspace. And I will be creating a package in this directory. Uh, and I need to give that package a name and here it suggests the name of your robot so oboe in my case and then move it config and this should create a package called oboe move it config within my move it workspace and then you can click generate package and it probably will give you some warning if you haven't filled in all of the checkboxes or all of these tabs but in my case, I did not want to add an end vector. So I'm going to select OK, and it says it generated my package. So now I can exit the Setup Assistant. And at this point, I should be able to go to my workspace. And I can see the package that it generated. And within that package, I can see all those files that were described on that last page. All right, so what we can do now is we can look in our launch file and find a demo.launch. And this gives us a quick way to test if the Move It Setup Assistant worked as expected. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that file.